Hello Grace Community Church, it is Palm Sunday. And we're gonna begin this Palm Sunday with a traditional reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Hear these words. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you at once and you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, on the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks around the road, and while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road, the crowds went ahead of them, and those that followed shouted, now I have my palm right handy here, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's begin our time with prayer. Father, we are so grateful to be able to celebrate 2024 Palm Sunday and rejoice of Jesus' choice to enter Jerusalem. They were ready to make him king, and yet one week later, he would be crucified for our sins and raised to new life that we might have eternal life. Father, on this Palm Sunday, we give you our praise and thanks, and we pray, Lord, that everything that we are about might contribute to your glory. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. It's time for announcements, and this being Holy Week, we have a few special events. First of all, I want to draw your attention to Good Friday, because this Good Friday at 3 p.m., we are having a Good Friday service right here in the sanctuary, and it's going to be a special service. I hope you plan to attend. We are inviting Dr. Brian Crawford from Chosen People Ministries, and he is going to be demonstrating for us a Passover Seder. Now, why this is so important and so apropos to this date is because this is the Last Supper. This is the supper in which our Lord initiated Holy Communion. And so this Friday at 3, here in the sanctuary, we will worship God in song and go right into the demonstration of the Seder. And it's going to help you understand why we celebrate Holy Communion together and how it comes from the Last Supper. It'll be about a one hour service and I hope you'll be there. And then coming Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday, we are going to be, first of all, celebrating at Hemingway Park at 6 a.m. Uh, it actually starts at 6.15, but they encourage you to get there a little bit earlier. And this is a community service representing a number of churches, and I encourage you to be there. We will not have an eight o'clock service because of that early service. But we're gonna be gathering as a congregation at 10 a.m. for our grand celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which brings us so much hope. 
And I hope you not only bring yourself there, but invite your family. This is one of those days that your kids, friends, relatives will come to church, even if they're not sure if they believe or not. It's going to be a wonderful service, and I think you and your family will be blessed. And then following that service, right around 11.15 or so, we're going to have our children's Easter egg hunt, which is going to take place on the school courtyard right behind the church. And again, it's going to be a lot of fun for the whole family. Moving into April, two quick announcements. One is that starting on April 2nd, Tuesday, we are going to be reinitiating a service at the Lakeview Terrace Assisted Living Facility. It's going to be upstairs in what they call the library. And I would encourage you, if you'd like to come just for an extra special service, Pastor Seth and I will officiate. It's just going to be a 30-minute service, but it's an opportunity to just bring Christ into folks that can't get around as easy as they once could. So keep that in mind, April 2nd, 9.30 a.m., Lakeview Terrace in the library, which is on the second floor. And then finally, have you considered becoming a member of Grace Community Church. It's a simple process, and we are going to have a membership class that's going to be on April 13. That's a Saturday, starting at 9 a.m. in the social room. Now, if you're interested, I would encourage you to call the office and let them know you're coming so we can plan accordingly. But what is membership? Membership is saying, I'm in this with you. And if you're just inquiring, it's an opportunity for you to investigate a little bit more as to what this church is all about. Well, there are other things to discover about the church, uh, game nights, women's association, all these things coming up in the next weeks ahead. But I hope you are a part, fully engaged in the life and body of our church. Please join me in singing, Here I Am to Worship. Light of the world, you stepped down into darkness Opened my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart to adore you Hope of a life spent with you here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me, to me.
we come to a time of prayer. It's not a somber time. It's actually a time of joy. And that joy connects with our ability to give to our Heavenly Father who loves us all of our needs. Now, while we're online, I like to be a little cryptic about the prayer requests in our church community, just so it's not all over the internet. But for those of you who've been attending, we've been in a series called Do You Believe in Miracles? And we have what we call our miracle box. And this box is filled with so many requests from so many people in our congregation coming before the Lord, asking for a miracle. And so maybe your request is in here, maybe it is not. But some of us are praying for our bodies. Some of us are praying for our mental well-being. Others for our financial condition. Still others may be lifting up our nation at another crossroads as we enter a presidential election in which clearly our country is very divided. All of these things are worthy of prayer. So as I pray, I'm going to be holding on to this box and I'm going to be asking for the Lord to do a miracle, to step in and heal, restore, make new. It's in his timing. It's in his way. But he said we can ask for anything. And so we're going to do that very thing. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we come before you in Jesus' name on behalf of this congregation. And in my hands, I hold what we've been calling the miracle box, the, the box containing prayer requests from our congregation. Father, I think of the centurion who told you, just say the word and my servant will be healed. In that same way, Lord, just say the word and you can heal and restore and make new. Father, we don't know all your ways and your timing, but we do know that you love us. And so, Father, we pray that an extension of that love would to be giving us a sense of your touch in our life. And Father, if it be your will to heal us, to meet our relational needs, to meet our emotional needs. And Father, we lift up our country. Our country is divided. It needs your touch. It needs your grace. In all and through all, we pray that you will receive all the honor and glory for what you're going to do. And now, Lord, we give to you back what you gave to us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament, comes from the book of Psalms, and this psalm is Psalm 146. We read this. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. 
Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is the Lord their God. He made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and the widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, throughout the generations. We now turn to the New Testament, and our reading is for today's message. It is the Gospel of John, chapter 11, starting in verse 17 and taking it to verse 43. We begin. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I believe that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus stayed outside the village at a place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed the blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man, sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe. So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted out loud, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth, and Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word.
I was only a few years into my job working at my new church in Manhasset, Long Island. We were at the cusp of becoming a multi-site church, that is a church that has more than one location. And there was a church in Chicago that we were studying how to do this from because they had multiple locations. So we flew out there, all the elders of the church and the staff. But there I was in that church's public restroom, hanging my head over a toilet bowl, throwing up because of the severe vertigo that I was going through. See, back in 1991, I was diagnosed by a doctor with Meniere's disease. It is a disease of the inner ear. And it came to light because I had some diminished hearing, I noticed, in my left ear. And for the first 10 years of this disease, it really just impacted me with ringing ears, which was quite annoying, and also just dealing with some diminished hearing loss. But as I move into the 2000s, suddenly another symptom kicked in, vertigo. And this vertigo would come and go. Usually when it came, it lasted for several hours. And what is a symptom or result of vertigo is nausea. And so while we're beginning our meetings with this church that we flew out from New York to Chicago for, my staff and elders are meeting and I'm in a bathroom hanging my head over a toilet bowl. And because the vertigo just doesn't go away, which means the nausea doesn't go away, I just stayed sitting on the floor in this bathroom, feeling miserable. This was my lot in life. And the feelings going through me at that time were, am I capable of maintaining this role as senior pastor of this church if I'm going to have these dizzy attacks on a regular basis. They would come sometimes about once a week, and the height of them came, I guess it was 2006, 2007. I'm preaching an Easter service to about 2,000 people, and suddenly I am feeling dizziness. While I am speaking, I had a stool up there, and I sat on the stool, and I put on my best acting face and I preached about the hope of the resurrection of Jesus while the whole room was spinning around and I was feeling nauseous. I made it through the message. Turns out people couldn't tell. It worked well. But this was my lot in life. And today, we're continuing our message series entitled, Do You Believe in Miracles? 
And I'll tell you the rest of my story a little bit later. But right now, I want us to see what we can learn as Jesus teaches his disciples, his friends, the crowd, through the most dramatic miracle of his ministry, raising Lazarus from the dead. Would you pray with me? Father, we're praying that you would teach us as your son taught the disciples. And Father, as we sit at Jesus' feet and watch what he is about to do, I pray that the lessons that he exemplifies by actions might resonate with us in hope and belief. And that in the end, we, your people, may have a deeper understanding that your son Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, that he is the son of God, and that we might have life believing in his name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our passage is chapter 11, and the reading has already been done, but we started in verse 17, and that was really because the length of this passage. But it really begins in verse 1 of chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. And it begins this way. Jesus finds out that a man that he loves, the brother of Mary and Martha, two dear friends of Jesus, have just informed him that Lazarus, again, who he loves, is very, very sick. And would you come? Would you come? Now, Jesus says to his disciples in verse 4 that this is happening for the glory of God, and thus the name of this message, the glory of God. So how is the glory of God going to unfold? Well, there are three scenes, if you will, that I want us to focus on to help us learn from this encounter with Jesus. The first scene is this, the wait, the wait. The second scene revolves around a question. So it's the question. And the third scene is the one that is the climax of our story, the miracle. So let's begin with the very first one, the wait. Because as we hear that somebody who Jesus loves is very, very sick, and that Jesus says this man is sick for the glory of God, it wasn't because he made some colossal mistake, it wasn't because of sin, it was ultimately going to bring God glory. And then we read this in verse 6. He hung around where he was for another two days. And we scratch our heads and we wonder, why? This is your friend. You love him. Why are you not rushing there to heal this man before he dies? But he doesn't move. He stays right there. And this point tells us something very important in our own desire to see God move and heal, restore in our own lives. Sometimes there's a wait. Sometimes it is a long wait. Now, in my case, for my own life and my disease, Meniere's disease, diagnosed in 1991, And the story I told you of being at the church in Chicago, we're now 2004. And we're wondering, how is this all going to unpack in terms of my well-being for this church? I have given up expecting God to even heal me at this point. I'm figuring it is my lot in life for the rest of my life. And I look at Jesus' statement that Lazarus is sick for the glory of God and that he loves Lazarus and he waits. He waits. I wish I could explain to you why you might have to wait for the Lord to restore you. And some of us wait for days, some of us wait for months, some of us wait for years, and some of us will not see our healing until we close our eyes here and open them in glory and we go, oh, wow, I'm completely well. 
and we long for that day. But I do know this, that God indeed loves you. It says it all through the scripture, particularly 1 John chapter 4. He loves you. He is the embodiment of love. And I know that all healing ultimately is for his honor and glory. It is for the glory of God. And yet, for that glory to manifest itself sometimes, it is a weight. I don't have a full answer why, except to say your healing will come in his time. Which brings me to the next point in this. Jesus starts moving and he arrives and he is greeted and, and Martha is, is, is distraught. Oh Lord, if, if only you had come. Mary, if only you had come, Lazarus would not have died. Yeah, they found that he died. In fact, they found out on the way, but they found out cryptically from Jesus. Jesus said to the disciples, he's sleeping. And the disciples thought, oh good. When somebody is sick and they're sleeping, that probably means they're going to get better because they're able to sleep now. And then Jesus just cut to the chase. No, he actually died. And he arrives and he begins a conversation with Martha. He says this, your brother will rise again. And Martha, she grew up in a Jewish environment that believed in the resurrection of the dead. It is something that scripture teaches. And she says to Jesus, yes, I believe he will be raised to new life at the resurrection, which is at the end of the age, when all believers will be raised to new life. But Jesus continues on and says in verse 25 and 26, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet will he live. And then he asks this question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? So let's unpack what Jesus says. First of all, this is one of the I am statements of Jesus in the book of John. People somewhat debate how many of them are, but it's about seven I am statements that Jesus makes. And in this one, he makes this bold pronunciation. Now, whenever we hear the phrase I am in the Greek, ego ami, we are thinking and reminded of Exodus chapter 3, when Moses says to the Lord, what shall I tell the people of Israel what your name is? And the Lord says, I am that I am. That is what you are to tell the people. And so Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life has a divine connotation in the statement in and of itself, adding to the fact that he's equating with his name the power of raising the dead adds to this broad comprehension of what exactly is Jesus saying right here? And so here comes the question, Martha, do you believe this? Now listen to her answer. Her answer shows up in verse 27. She says, I believe, yes, yes, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is to come. Now, when she says this, this is the completion of why John said he even wrote this book. Do you remember we've said it each week that in John chapter 20, verse 30, 31, John tells us that these signs that he's recorded are here to help us believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing we might have life in his name. And that is exactly what Martha proclaims at this moment. She is believing, she is confessing exactly what John is hoping that his readers will believe. But I'm not sure she was ready to fully understand what Jesus was about to do when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. See, that's a very abstract concept. And what does this mean for her? What does this mean for Mary? What does it mean for Lazarus? 
You see, she grew up understanding, yes, the resurrection of the dead. She believes that at the end of the age. But Jesus calls the question, what do you believe, Martha? Now, I would say that Martha gave the right answer. She gave the best answer that any person following Jesus could probably ever give. But it turns now to the question of you and I. What do you and I believe about Jesus? Do you believe that he is God living among us, Emmanuel, that he's the Son of God? Do you believe that he was God's chosen instrument, the anointed one, to be the Messiah, to draw people to himself? And do you believe that becoming a follower of Jesus will bring you, as John calls it, life, and not just any life, Jesus says, life to the full. See, this is the heart of Christianity. Many of us call ourselves Christians, but what we actually mean, I'm not Jewish, I'm not Muslim, I'm Christian. But we don't actually function and live our life in a way that is flowing through with the, the truth and hope of Christianity. And still others are more of a wait and see. I put a prayer request in the miracle box. If that is healed or, or I, my financial needs are met or, or a restoration in my broken relationship is given to me, then yes, I will believe. But sometimes belief is based on what we have before us. And, and what Mary and Martha had before them was a dead brother. And yet Martha presses on and says, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. The waiting, I don't know why the wait. The question, what do you believe? And now comes the miracle. So Mary comes out to see Jesus. And Mary says, well, we would expect, Lord, if only you would come. Lazarus would be alive. And she says, take me to the grave. Jesus says, take me to the grave. And we read a description of Jesus' attitude at the moment. This is what we read. Jesus was angry. He was angry. It's kind of surprising to read that in the text. And then we read the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He wept with Mary and Martha at the loss of Lazarus. He knows there's going to be a resuscitation of Lazarus because this is not the resurrection at the end day. So it's going to be a resuscitation of life into him. But he weeps. And I, and I think this is the reason why. Because this is the peak of everything that went wrong at the fall in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned and, and the world just spiraled into a place where people die, a place of pain, a place of sickness, a place of just brokenness, all stems from the fall. And Lazarus dying, his friend, Jesus' friend, who he loved being dead, makes him angry that we're in the fall. But Jesus came to begin the restoration of making us right, of moving us back into Eden. And every time another follower of Jesus is, is joining in, it's that pathway, it's that journey back to Eden, back to the place that we are supposed to be. And what he is about to do with Lazarus is bringing us into the ought of God, the way things ought to be. And they arrive in the grave. And Jesus says, roll away the stone. And they say, Lord, he's been dead for four days. He's going to stink. He said, roll it away. They roll it away. And then Jesus prays, Lord, I know you hear me, but I'm praying out loud so that they also can hear me and that by hearing they might believe, which is the whole heart of the gospel. And then Jesus says in verse 43, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out and is restored to his family. Now, why this is a 
res resuscitation and not the resurrection of the dead. It's very simple. Unfortunately, Lazarus would have to die again. <laughs> no one should have to die twice, but he's going to die twice. But at the resurrection of the dead, the, the culmination of all events, that is the final resurrection. There is no more death after that. So in this story, we have the wait, intentional for the glory of God. We have the question, what do you believe? And then we have the miracle, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Where are you in the spectrum? Are you still waiting? Are you pondering the question, what do you actually believe about Jesus? Or have you encountered the miracle? Do you have a testimony of God's kindness in your life? I want to finish my story. So my journey of dealing with Meniere's disease only increased in 2005, 2006, 2007. I reached a point that I thought maybe I need to quit ministry. Who am I kidding? There are days in which I'm just hanging my head over my office garbage can, throwing up because of the vertigo. Or I'd be counseling a couple, and while I'm looking at them and pretending to be fully engaged in this counseling, the whole room begins to spin. And I'm like, okay, here we go. I can't survive. And there were sessions where I just had to tell the couple, I'm feeling ill right now. We'll have to reschedule and do it another time. It reached a culmination in 2008. It was October, and I received a phone call from a friend who was the head of a mission agency called Mission Door, led headquarters in Denver, Colorado. He called me up and said, Steve, I would wonder, I was wondering if you'd be willing to serve on our mission board. And I said, well, what are the requirements? And he says, well, you have to fly to Denver twice a year for the board meetings. And airplanes aggravate the inner ear, which aggravates my Meniere's disease. So I said, uh, his name was Rick. I said, Rick, I don't think I can do it. I'm just dealing with this disease, and I, I just don't think so. And he said to me what probably Christians regularly say, why don't you pray about it? But how do you say no to why don't you pray about it? So I said, okay, I'll pray. I prayed about it. And I felt an answer from the Lord. It was the words of a pastor I had growing up, and the words were this, Steve, I have a wonderful way of letting you know when it's time to retire. You will die. And until then, I want you to keep busy for the kingdom. It's not what I wanted to hear from the Lord, but I, I contacted my friend and I said, I'm going to step out in faith and say, yes, I will serve on the board. Okay, I made my faith statement. A few weeks later, now we're talking the beginning of November, a woman in the church came up to me. Now, I love this woman. She has been special in many ways over the course of my ministry in New York, but I also found that she marched to a little different drummer. And she comes up to me and says, Pastor Steve, the Lord told me, now whenever somebody says that, the Lord told me, I always have like question marks, cautions. This is what she said. The Lord told me that in the new year, your disease is going to be taken away. And I said to her, I, I hope you're right. But I didn't really have any belief or hope. So we enter into the new year. And my many years goes into remission. In fact, I have not had another Meniere's attack since 2008. And now it's 2024. The Lord graciously restored me and he did it in a way to make sure I knew it was a miracle by having this woman come up to me and say, the Lord is going to do it in the new year. And my test of faith was that guy who said, would I serve on the board? 
And, and I put all these pieces together. I had the weight, 1991 to 2008. The weight was so long, I gave up hoping that God was ever going to heal me of this disease. And then comes the question. And for me, the question was from God, what do you believe? When I remember the words of that pastor that said, the Lord has a wonderful way of letting you know when it's time to retire, you die. And the question from that man, will you serve on the board? What are you going to do? Because it's connected with what do I believe about God? Which led to the miracle, being made whole, not having this issue anymore. Now, last week I told you when he touched my heart, and that was in 1991. Major miracle, one that I talk about, one that I love to talk about, good glory to God. But if you pick up the years, that was the same year I was diagnosed with this Meniere's disease. So God heals me on this, and, and then I have this other thorn that I'm dealing with and end up dealing with for another 16 years. But I've come to discover this about our precious Lord that his waiting is for his purposes and I'm going to trust him on it because I genuinely believe he loves me. He loves me. And number two, those questions, what do you believe? Martha, do you believe this? I want to do what Martha did. Give what she had. I'm not sure what it means, Lord, about you're the resurrection of the dead, but I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And she gave what she had, the belief that she had to offer. And then comes the miracle. I don't know when your miracle will come. Soon, it might take a while, maybe in glory. But I have come to see that Jesus is worth waiting for. And as we wrap up the series today, do you believe in miracles? I hope you do. Because I've seen them in my own life and I believe that they can happen for you. So as I wrap up and close in prayer, I'm going to be holding this miracle box again. And I'm just praying for you while I hold it. Father, you know where we hurt. You know where our anxieties are. You know where we're sick and in need of touch. Father, in your graciousness, would you bring glory to yourself, just like the passage said, by calling us to the question, what do we believe? And leading us to the miracle, be it on this side of Jordan or be it in glory. And Father, may you receive all the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit.
Thank you for being a part of our service, and I hope you'll be a part of the Good Friday service taking place at 3 p.m. in the sanctuary. And my greatest hope is that you will wait on the Lord, believe in Him, and anticipate great things from a great God. Father, bless us, this congregation, your sheep. In Jesus' name, amen.